So do you want me to record my end in 4K so that I can send it to you for your movie or? That would be- Do you want me to record your end so that I can just stream it or how do you want to do it? No, I'm, I'm more interested in, uh, in the Zoom recording to be honest, but if you want to record in 4K, that would be of course valuable. The more material, the better. Well, I mean, you're going to do post-production and like edit this into something, right? Exactly. So if I give you a better, better source material, it's going to be better for you. So I'll just not record your feed and I'll just record me and then it'll look good. Awesome. All right. I'm going <clears> to <throat> dive. Let me, let, me, uh, let me just change the setting real quick to get the 4K because it's 1920, 1080 current. No, it is 4K actually. Let's make sure I got enough hard drive space. Yeah, we're golden. All right, I'm recording my end. Okay. So thanks a lot for taking the time to speak to me, Richard. Uh, my name's Tom Gillespie. I'm making a documentary film about uh, fake influences in the crypto space. My story is specific to uh, the scooter coin scamdemic, but I realize that you've been operational in the space a lot longer than some, and you have a keen eye for spotting these types of scammy projects. So what I'd like to do is just ask you a few questions generally about the industry and some of the things uh, that you've experienced yourself. Sure. So All right. to start off, let's, uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your role in the crypto economy. Well, I started out as a miner in Bitcoin in the first quarter of 2011. It was 50 cents at the time. And then I bought a lot when it was 30, helped make the top, went down to two. Oops. But in Bitcoin, it's not how early you got in, it's how long you held. So, you know, if you held from 30 to two, you got to write it up to uh, 1300. And then you got to write it down to 266. And then you got to write it up to 20,000. And then you got to write it up down to three. And then up to 14, down to three, and up to 12. And who knows now? 12,000. So 12,000 is a lot bigger than 30. You're talking a lot bigger than about Bitcoin, right? Yes. Yeah. That's where I got in. And then, you know, if you want technology to outperform Bitcoin, you have to build it. So there's a lot of things in finance that Bitcoin cannot, will not ever address. So currency is a small component of finance. Uh, for instance, the, you know, banking system, the largest product they have there is a savings account. And the time deposit, which is just a savings account that pays you more if you lock up your money. Bitcoin can't do that. We'll never be able to do that. But uh, I built something that uh, does. It's hex.com, H-E-X. So, you know, if you, want, if you want technology to improve, someone has to build it. And no one built a replacement for the, uh, the time deposit at the bank. So I built that. But I've also got I've, a YouTube um, channel. And I've read a little, Twitter, little bit about it. Mm -hmm. um, it's beyond me, of course, at this, at this time, I'm still quite new to the space as you can imagine. It's really easy to understand. I mean, like Bitcoin was designed to be peer to peer digital cash. It failed to do that. Instead, it became a digital store of value with, you know, a high volatility, but as long as that volatility keeps ratcheting, you know, to new all time highs every three or four years, who cares? You know, yes. And like it may be a, an oscillating value ratchet that just keeps sucking in economic energy from the rest of the world will eventually result in everyone having a wallet and having a very efficient peer to peer value transfer system. You know, there's not really, there's no really easy way to, to bootstrap an entirely new digital economy, except like fighting the hard fight. <clears throat> yeah. And that's where a lot of these crypto influences or self-proclaimed crypto influencers come in. So I want to get your take specifically on the crypto influencer space, uh, mm -hmm. both how you would have seen it evolve, how it's 
how it's kind of grown up and where it's at today. Sure. Um, there's this tragedy of the commons with the consciousness economy. I'm hitting you with some big terms here. <laughs> there's a branch of industry that makes money on depriving you of your consciousness. They want you to absorb their content. They want your eyes on their website. They want your eyes on their advertisements and they spend millions of dollars of research and stock photography of girls in bikinis to get you to, to stare at their website through the screen that you're looking at, whether it be a computer or phone. Well, the people that like produce good news, they put it behind a paywall so they can make money, but the people that produce terrible, horrible, shitty news, that's free. So lies are free and the truth is expensive and it leads to this world where it's easier and more likely to be misled for other people's profit than it is to, to be accurately informed. And, you know, influencers are just another, another version of that same problem that people want to monetize you. They want to get your money out of your hands and they're going to tell you whatever bullshit story they need to in order to do that. So whether it's inflate, uh, you know, look for the biggest differences. If it bleeds, it leads, you know, how can we make this thing the most volatile, explosive, disagreeable thing? And then that's the opposite of what makes democracy effective for democracy to work. You need consensus because you can't pass new laws without consensus. And if everyone focuses on differences instead of similarities, it makes consensus very hard to arrive at. And, you know, it's, it's, it's an, an epidemic or in the times we're in, maybe we'll call it a pandemic of just terrible uh, misalignment of, of goals and values. Like, you know, the, the news is there to bullshit you. The website that's feeding you the news is there to bullshit you. The people that you think are experts in the space are there to bullshit you. You know, people, people put lines on a chart and if you looked at their personal trading account, they just lose money. And you're like, okay, so you just lose money, but now you're going to upgrade and go influence other people to also lose money so that you can make money on a referral link. And in, and in this space, that's how everybody makes all their money is referral links. And that, so it's like, that's the defining difference. I mean, like what's the, the major upgrade that the crypto economy has provided the influencer? Is it the token, the, the I, referral? I think, I think crypto influencers is a very small set of influencers in general. And, you know, it's such, it's been such an issue that they've passed specific legislation regarding, you know, you have to say what is a paid advertisement. You have to say, you know, what you've been compensated to, to produce as content um, because the influencers are just misleading people for profit to the people's detriment. So, you know, if you're on the internet, it's very easy to find bullshit. That's just not true. It's everywhere. And then, you know, what are influencers except that? I am not an expert in influencers because I don't tend to follow them because they're full of shit. So the people that I follow are people that I can learn from. What am I going to learn from an influencer? Nothing, nothing. Well, I'm again, better than them in every way. Again, if they're self-proclaimed influence, then, then you have a fair statement there, but arguably you're but self think, think, think about, think, right? think about it this way. Why does someone have the term influencer? Because they have no other merit. If you start a business in the, in the space and you're looking at the crypto space, then you're a founder. If you're a trader and you make some good calls and you're profitable, maybe you could call yourself a trader or a technical analyst or a fundamental analyst or quant. If you're, you know, like influencer basically means you have not produced anything of value whatsoever you flap your lips and talk shit, usually supporting and unsupporting a thing at the same time. And then as time passes and it turns out to be good or bad, you just retweet your previous positive or negative statement. You say, hey, look, I called it. No, you called both things. <laughs> you posted one good thing and one bad thing. You wait to see how it turns out and then you retweet the good or bad thing to look like you actually know what you're doing. It's uh, Influencers are like, if they were good and wholesome people and if they, if they didn't, you know, use misleading titles for clickbait and they didn't use stupid YouTube face thumbnails 
which I guess is in the game. Like you have to do those things if you want traffic because that's what YouTube forces you to do, I guess. Um, and by proxy, the people that use to YouTube because YouTube's just analyzing their behavior. You know, if those guys were able to create better outcomes for their viewership, then you would say it was a, it was a good curation attempt, right? So what are DJs? DJs are people that curate music. Hey, here's a world of music. Lots of it sucks. Here's the ones that don't suck. We're going to show those to you. That's what Google does. Hey, the internet's full of information. You want information for this search. We're going to curate all that and just give you the results that are relevant to that search. If influencers did a good job curating knowledge for their users, then you would promote them. You'd say, this is great. You know, these influencers, they keep people out of bad projects. They get people into good projects. Look how wonderful everything is. But in crypto, the only people that can afford to pay the influencers are fucking scams. And so, or, or, or not, not just scams, but things that people lose a lot of money to. So if you, if, <laughs> if you look at who can afford to advertise in crypto, by and large, the majority of things advertising in crypto are things that just absolutely destroy the finances of people that participate. And then they use a portion of that money that they get by fucking people over to fund their marketing campaigns. That's the majority. So the majority of influencers are paid by companies that, that harvest the sorrow and horror of users. And you know, uh, <laughs> like it's, if you have, if you're on YouTube and you don't have your ads turned off, you are supporting everyone watching your channel getting fucked over by scams. They're going to get buy now your option scams. They're going to get copy trading scams. Oh, you know, you're not a good trader, but you can copy someone who is. No, no, you're all going to lose money. And the only person that's going to make money is the house. And this has been that way for a hundred years. Everyone knows the house wins and the traders lose. And, you know, I'm one of the few people in crypto that tells you that like, yes, you will lose your money. If you trade, you're going to lose money. It, the only people that get rich in crypto, the majority are people that just hold and you better pick the right project and just hold it. You pick the wrong project, it goes to zero, it never gets back up. You pick the right project, it flops around up and down a lot, but over time, it tends to do very well. I mean, Bitcoin was up 2 million X, 200 million percent from a penny to $20,000. That's real money. That's real money with real counterparties. You can really exit at that, you know, a lot of the hundreds of millions of dollars are sold at, at 20,000. So like, you know, it's a highly volatile space. It's very profitable. It's full of bullshit artists and, and scams. And you've got to learn how to navigate that, right? And influencers guess, in general are not a good way to do that. Yeah, I mean, I guess this Satoshi character that birthed Bitcoin into the world, if you like, if he'd been stuck around, um, he would have been the ultimate crypto influencer, I imagine. Eh... People, I mean, people like to think influence. he was better than he was. Um, he has influence even though he's, an, he's anonymous, right? Everybody's watching the wallets, movements, and what have you. So. Well, there aren't any movements, so there's no movement. No, but there are, there are people watching with a keen eye. Well, sure, but I mean, it's like, it, I believe Satoshi is deceased. In general, people that uh, work very hard to gain resources at some point utilizes resources. It's been 10 years now. He hasn't spent. So a little weird, you know, a little weird. And not only hasn't he spent, but he also, there's no one producing content similar to his, like they're not, there's no improvement proposals. There's no lobbying for certain directions over other directions. You know, I, I had to do that work for him because he wasn't around to do it. So I have done more to defend Bitcoin from bad things than Satoshi has in the last however many years because he ain't here, you know? Um, I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with anonymity in crypto. I think, I think privacy is a human right. And if you want people to be honest, they need to be able to do so without the fear of retribution. And anonymity is the only thing that really provides that. So anonymity is very important for functioning democracies and society and cryptocurrency you know cryptocurrency really it's its primary value proposition for a lot of people is its censorship resistance you know if you live in china and they control where you can send your money you can use bitcoin to send your money however you like and route around government censorship um so if, if you like cryptocurrency for its censorship resistant properties then 
you know, anonymity really, really, really helps a lot. Sure. But I mean, a large part of the problem comes with that baggage of anonymity, right? I mean, no, is- you get scammers working with their real names constantly all the time. Theranos was a scam. She stood right on stage and spoke right to the public. Enron was a scam. Bernie Madoff was a scam. But I mean, she's obviously mentally, mentally disturbed as well to, to go, to take it to that extreme. I mean, there's a, Uh, right? I I don't think, I don't think you need to have, I think you can have a character defect without being mentally ill. I I think that you can be a scamming piece of shit without, having it as your some you know defect of your soul or whatever you know it's just decisions people can choose to to do good things or bad things and if you do good things long enough you're a good person if you do bad things long enough you're a bad person you know like so i don't anonymity to the best of my knowledge the majority of scams that have fucked people over have involved non-anonymous founders a very small subset of scams has involved anonymous founders. Anonymity is not the problem. The problem is just scams. Like the, the scam is the problem, not the public knowing who's doing the scam or not. Oh, well, that's a fair statement. But what about pseudo anonymous? So the film I'm making is about fake influences, these people that peddle their credibility is much larger than it actually is. Sure. Um, These people put themselves on, they make themselves the poster child of all kinds of shitty coins out there. Uh And uh, they're still out there operating today. It's almost like it's easier, in fact, than being completely anonymous to be pseudo-anonymous. Well, the... the (laughs) The issue here is that the public is goddamn stupid. And when you try and make the public do things that are in their own best interests, they tell you to fuck yourself and they do what's not in their own best interests. So everybody knows that gambling is bad. It's not good. Shouldn't do it. But because so many millions of people want to do it anyway, we create whole legal frameworks around it. We're like, okay, fine. You guys are stupid. You have to fucking go waste your time exchanging money between each other or fine. Okay. So we're going to make these laws that state, Oh, they have to make the odds, you know, public to you. But does that make the world any better? Like the fact that you can go to the casino and see which games are shittier for you and which ones are less shitty. Does that actually make the world any better? Not really. Or it's just like, it's like those laws that people have where, you know, if, if someone's going to fuck you over, they have to give you a long contract full of legalese. You're never even going to read to explain exactly how they're going to fuck you. Is, is having that written description of how you're going to get fucked actually making the world better? No, because people are still getting fucked. So it's not, it's like you can't, if you don't like, so you, you've got this abstraction issue here. We have scams. And then here we have scam promoters And then we have dishonest and honest scam promoters, ones that accurately represent their qualifications and ones that lie about their qualifications. And so you have to choose what level of abstraction you want to attack this shitty behemoth of suck, right? And then what powers this behemoth of suck? The stupid idiots that just hand their money to anything. So I I scream and yell on Twitter trying to get people to do the right thing. Financial software is hard. Cryptographic financial software is even harder. You cannot rush to market without testing and security audits. You will lose all your money. So what are these FOMO tarred? FOMO means fear of missing out. Tarred is a a modification of the word retard. I'm taking it back. It just means slow. That's that's what it means. Um, These FOMO tards, they just buy anything. You tell them, listen, this is unaudited software. You shouldn't be putting your money into it. It could go to zero. So just today, People release some stupid project called YAM, Y-A-M. Then huge bug gets found 48 hours after it was invented. And that's, you know, went from like uh, the price it was to 95% lower like that. And who predicted that? Me. I predicted that because I understand how hard software is. 
show do people listen? You... No, they won't fucking listen. Exactly, and that's my point. How do you stand out? Because whether you, you know, whether you like to recognize it or not, you also have influence in the space. And you say you you try to warn people and what have you out there on Twitter and that, but how do you uh, define yourself among amongst all these other characters out there? Well, I mean, and why why should they trust you above above uh, any other character? Well, unfortunately, if you have a finite amount of time to evaluate someone's competence, you're going to have to take shortcuts. So if the person that you're listening to is rich and has been rich for fucking decade, you know, and has been right over and over and over again, that person probably deserves more respect than a poor person who claims to know a lot about generating money and who has a history of being wrong all the time. So, I mean, if you had infinite time, you could evaluate and assign a team of people to every single statement anyone ever uttered and then, you know, rank their truthfulness. But if you don't have that type of time or resources, you're going to have to take some shortcuts. Yeah. So and I think I, that, that ties back into the, the type of demographic, um, the people buying these shitty, these shitty coins and getting wrapped in, they're often younger folk, right? Um, a lot of kids. I don't actually know. I don't have good. I mean, for my demographics on my channel, everyone's kind of my age. So on on my channels, it's a hundred percent guys, and they're all like thirty five. So, I don't I don't have young people that watch me very much. Statistics do you, wise, do you think uh, you would? Would it be beneficial if they did? Perhaps. Um, I mean, if we assume, I, I'm right all the fucking time, dude. So what I do is I would tell you why I believe something, the evidence that I used for input to my reasoning and the reasoning. So here's the data. Here's my reasoning. Here's my outcome. Then you can go and inspect whatever parts of that you want, right? So I say you shouldn't use software that has not been through a security audit. And then I can give you a list of a hundred things where people have lost millions and millions of dollars because they didn't have any security audits. Well, do I, does, does anything in that statement require me to, to be intelligent? No. Like I, I, you could have gotten that statement from a homeless guy and evaluated it and been like, yeah, that makes sense. It's like if a homeless guy says, you know, you should brush your teeth. What are you going to spite him and be like, I ain't taking none of your advice, homeless guy. No, like advice can stand on its own and be useful if it is of the quality in which I offer it. So it's like, I give, I give you some examples, right? If you, if you buy a token that has not been through a security audit, it can and will, and rather often does go to zero and fail entirely because software is hard. Financial software is harder and cryptographic financial software is the hardest yet. Very, 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 very hard. So, if you, if you rush things, the things get fucked up. You have to take the time to do things right, period. Another thing, people fall for appeals to complexity. If something is too complicated for them to understand, they assume it's good. So there's this new thing called uh, rebasing. Rebasing is where... Uh, how do, I, how do I describe this to you? If you're not a trader, it's hard to describe. Let's say you had $100 and you, uh, you decided that you wanted to take a loan on that $100 to buy some extra coin, shit coin. So your $100 would have bought you, let's say, 100 shit coins. But you decide to take a loan and you take a, an extra $100 loan on your $100 and you buy $200 of shit coin. What that means is if the price of shitcoin goes up, you are making twice the gains because you have twice the position because you bought $200 worth because you borrowed an extra hundred on your hundred, right? Yeah. You're leveraged long. When the price goes up, 
every shit coin you have goes up in value and all the shit coins you borrowed go up in value. Now, here's the downside. What happens when the price goes down? Well, now the price of your shit coins went down, but it went down twice as, you're, you're losing value twice as fast because you have twice as large of the position. And so when your collateral is dollar and you're betting on shitcoin, you're just amplifying the moves. It goes up, it goes up more, it goes down, it goes down more. But there's this magic thing where you use the shitcoin itself as collateral instead of using $100 for collateral. And this introduces something called convexivity. And what convexivity means is, okay, the price of the shitcoin went up. So now you're earning more shitcoins because when you borrowed them, the profit on those borrowed ones gets added to your wallet. So you started out with your wallet of shitcoin that you're using for collateral. You took your margin position. Now when the price goes up, you're getting more coins and those coins are worth more. You're, you're multiplying your gains. But then the convexivity is, what if the price goes against you? Well, now the price of your collateral is worth less because the coins are worth less. And because of your margin position, you're getting coins sucked out of your wallet. And so you're going to be liquidated much quicker. Liquidated is, hey, you took out a $100 loan using shitcoin as collateral. But now this shitcoin is not worth enough to pay that loan back. So we need to liquidate your ass very quickly and zero you out to pay off the person that lent that to you. So this rebasing thing, it's identical or nearly identical to margin long because when the price of the coin goes up, they just give you more coins. But when the price of the coin goes down, they take some coins out of your wallet. And everyone's just like, oh, it's this new amazing thing. But me, because I'm smart, I can just look at its parts and see, no, this is just relabeled margin. This is just a margin position. And you guys have just taken margin trading and shoved it into like the core token protocol. And, and how is that better? Like how, what is the use of that? You're just, you're just increasing volatility. You, it's like, and then everyone, because they're so stupid, they don't understand it. They think it's new and innovative. And so then how, like, how long does it take me to describe to you that rebasing coins are not new and innovative? They're stupid. It took like 10 minutes to do that. But yeah. for these idiots that look at a chart, they're like, oh, price go up. Hard word I don't understand. FOMO, buy. And then they get fucking wrecked and it goes to zero because they won't fucking listen to good advice that I give them. Yeah, no, I've seen them. My mind. I've seen them whinging on Twitter, mate. Oh, I've seen them. It's all this new DeFi, DeFi stuff, right? All the services where you can basically earn interest and what have you, and loan against your collateral, crypto, what have you. But listen, let's let's move on. I've got a couple more questions I'd like to get back on focus here. Um, blockchain and identity are often used in conjunction does does blockchain maybe have a, some sort of a solution to to this these issues of fake fake influences or or no. scam the scamdemic if you like no. is there is there a solution baked into the technology perhaps no. no not at all absolutely not people so a blockchain is just a really 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 shitty really 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 slow database period. That is all it is. A blockchain is a really slow, really shitty database. You don't, when you try and write to the blockchain, sometimes you can't, blocks are full. When you try and write to the blockchain, sometimes you can't. The price that you bid for blockchain space gets outbid by somebody else. When you try and write data to the blockchain, sometimes it invisibly disappears because a fork occurred or your block was orphaned. It is fucking garbage. It is the worst. The most profitable companies in the world that have billions and billions and billions, even trillions of dollars of value in them. They don't use the fucking blockchain. Apple doesn't use the blockchain. Amazon doesn't use the blockchain. Twitter doesn't use the blockchain. Facebook doesn't use the blockchain. They do not give a fuck about the fucking blockchain because it is a terrible, slow, shitty database. Which means... What use does it fucking have? What use does the blockchain have? The blockchain is only useful for censorship resistance. That is all. That is it, period. Because you can't kick its door down. Oh, mate. You've, you've frozen on me. 
you've you've frozen at your end, mate. Bloody hell. Yeah, you want to try refreshing? 